Well, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, and by the way, I always say hello to any space cadets that are out here. We have a few space cadets. Hey, we have some. Good. That's great. Um, my topic today is space, our world above. And I'll tell you why we came to that topic in just a few minutes. I have had the uh, fortune and, and the honor to have spent over three decades uh, working with the space shuttle program out at the Kennedy Space Center. And now, as a uh, member of, thank you, now as a member of NASA's docent program, I spend a lot of time talking to the visitors, the tourists that come out to the Space Center. And it's remarkable how many things, uh, they come from all over the world, which helps the, the fact that we're right next door to a cruise terminal. But we do get a lot of people from all over the world. And they have a lot of interest in space. They come and they want to know what NASA is doing. You know, what's going on? What's in the future? But a question we hear recently is they want to know why NASA stopped. And it sort of leads you to wonder. You know, so I thought uh, today we better take a look at that world of space above us. And I think you'll see that not only has NASA not stopped, it's certainly out there very active and uh, probably, if anything, it's expanding. So, to cover this territory, I thought we'd do th three topics. Let's talk about what is complete, what has changed, and there is one major factor there, as well as what is coming. So let's start with what's complete. Okay, yes. The space shuttle program is complete. And uh, after the five shuttles together total, and these are all reusable vehicles, by the way, NASA has been using them for 30 years, total launches, as I think we just mentioned, yes, 135 launches. Most people stop paying attention after 50. And we, we've asked, and they have. We. Uh, Along with those launches, we carried aloft 355 different astronauts and scientists. And those guys were able to do phenomenal different projects and scientific feats uh, up there in space that were never part of any previous program that we could handle. So one of the things that made this happen, and that is the fact that the shuttle cargo bay is so large. We're going to get a good use of that in a few minutes. And the fact that it's a return reusable vehicle. But before we get into that, and I'm going to introduce you to a couple of projects that are current, but before we do that, I thought we'd talk a little bit about what we did with the space shuttles now that the program's over. That's a shuttle on its transporter. We've sent these shuttles all over the United States. There is uh, Endeavor is in the uh, California Science Museum out in Los Angeles. We have, of course, Atlantis down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And we have Columbia in Washington, D.C. in the Smithsonian Institute. Now, we do have one called the Enterprise. It was a uh, test article. It never really flew in space. Um, it's in the New York Harbor on board the aircraft carrier Intrepid, so it's on display as well. And by the way, yes, as if anybody asks, it was named after the USS Starship Enterprise of Star Trek fame. <laughs> they petitioned for it, and they got it. Now, let's go back and talk about these two, two really uh, projects that we've come up with. The first one is the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, these projects, both these two are talking about, are complete. They're finished but they're still active and in use. So right now, the Hubble's flying overhead about 340 miles up. And it's moving along, it is zipping along at about 17,500 miles an hour. Its purpose up there is to study light waves coming in from deep space. It also has the ability to look down into the deep realms of space and a little bit past time it goes to a time of just, just up after the Big Bang. It also has looked at 
well, I should say this. You can look back into time. And the way we do that is that light coming to us from an object that's really deep in space may take light years to get here. So the subject that it came from may not be there anymore when you see it. So what you're seeing is the way it was. You're looking back into time. Now the Hubble has also looked at about 30,000 different celestial objects for our, astro for our astronomers. And they also have collected over 500,000 pictures. It's all in their archives. I think it's only fair to say that the Hubble Space Telescope has rewritten the textbooks on astronomy. Now, this other big project that is still in works and is also uh, above our heads was our first attempt at putting a science lab into space at about 240 miles altitude. Now, you know it today as the International Space Station. It's a, a collaborative effort between the United States with Russia, uh, with Europe, with Japan, and with Canada. Now, the five countries together, and we uh, used our space shuttle to take up 95% of the pieces and parts to build the space station. In addition, the shuttle supported 160 different spacewalks. That was for our astronauts all suited up and out there and had to build this thing. They put this uh, station together and it is, a, it is officially now complete. Inside the space station, we have a lot of experiments going on. On any given day, there is about 150 different, ex different science experiments in work. So much so that NASA actually puts out a publication. It's called the spin-offs. Puts it out once a year. And this last, uh, this last one was 235 pages long. This is spin-offs in space research. Some of the other facts that are kind of fun about the space station, and that is that it weighs 100 million pounds. It's a lot to be floating around up there. It has a volume inside of about the same as a 747 aircraft. It supports four separate laboratories, and its overall size is the size of a football field, and, it, and that includes the end zones. So it's a pretty large craft. One of the uh, most unique features that I, I like to talk about about the space station is that for the, we have had people living on the space station for over 16 years, continuously. Most people don't know that. So we, in, in effect, um, probably have taken some of the planet's population off and moved it on to outer space already. So, we've had, so we have six people up there right now. Six astronauts are stationed up there all the time. By the way, you can see the space station. It's sort of a bright star, and it's identified easier because it's moving, and you can very noticeably moving across the sky. What you can do is go to this internet site, spotthestation.nasa.gov, and that will give you the schedule of when the space station flies over your area by zip code. True. That's kind of cool, I think. So, next subject. What has changed? And I did want to put this in because there is one major change that we want to try to be aware of. When the space shuttle program ended, NASA lost its ability to go to low Earth orbit. Now, low Earth orbit is an area that we've used for years. For us, it's a space about 400 miles up above us. Uh, we actually call it LEO, low Earth orbit. And you'll see that in the papers from sometimes. They refer to LEO. It's where we've been. Uh, for the last 30 years. But with NASA, it's by the way, it's also referred to as the backyard, Earth's backyard. We've been up there with all kinds of experiments, and that's where the space shuttle's at, and it's where the space station's at, uh, and the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA's been there for so long, it being a government agency, and it also uses taxpayers' dollars, so there is a requirement that it passes on the knowledge, the technology of how to go to LEO. Well, certainly it has done that. 
And now that NASA has moved on to uh, newer, newer challenges, the private world of business has moved in very quickly. We have companies that have picked up on that knowledge that uh, passed down by NASA. And they do this, by the way, they pass it to the universities, science research centers for NASA, colleges, sometimes special programs. So the private business has picked up on that, and they are now in low Earth orbit, and they are running a very profitable business of hauling unmanned payloads up to LEO. They actually do it for the military, they do it for other schools and businesses, and they actually do it for NASA. NASA has a contract with one of the companies to haul supplies up to the space station. That's in low Earth orbit, or LEO. Um, also, a couple of companies are building a manned craft, so very soon, the private world will be taking our astronauts up to the International Space Station. So what has changed? Well, what used to be an area that we refer to as science and space and NASA is now a private business zone around the circles of the Earth. So that much has a, become a major feature. What's coming? Always a good question. We have 30 launches scheduled at the Kennedy Space Center this year. That's private and government. That's a, uh, a record. And I understand that there's probably 40, maybe 45, scheduled for next year. We also have two or three new companies showing up. One, one is called the Moon Express. Now, its intent is to land a vehicle on the moon and that will be a first for a private business. We have another company called the Bigelow Corporation. And the Bigelow Corporation is working with NASA. Uh, they're, they're developing or building expandable uh, living quarters. These will be used in the future for deep space flights and uh, probably for habitats on maybe some far off planet. Uh, right now, there actually is one attached to the International Space Station, except for testing purposes. Uh, we also have a little company called Blue Origin. I mean, it's a kind of a spin-off from some other company called Amazon or whatever. Uh, they have just built a factory right outside Kennedy Space Center gates. And they are building their second and large rocket. Uh, it's called the New Glenn rocket. And it is going to be big, and it's going to be probably, I would say, direct competition with that SpaceX company that's doing so well. Um, there is one other big project coming along. It's, uh, I think it's scheduled to be launched next year in October. It's the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, first of all, the James Webb Telescope is not a replacement for the Hubble Telescope. It's, we're going to have two. But with the technology on this new telescope, with the computers, and with a, a mirror three times the size of what's on Hubble, it's going to be able to look into the even deeper uh, realm of the universe and we expect it to maybe even be able to see the formation of galaxies and maybe even the edge of the universe. What makes all this possible? Well, the one thing with the web is its location. The Hubble Space Telescope is about 340 miles up. The Webb Space Telescope will be located 932,000 miles out into space. Or another way to say it, 700,000 miles past the moon. Now, it is going to have a crystal clear view out there. We don't really know what all it's going to see. But I do think that we'll have to be rewriting the astronomy textbooks again. So what about NASA? What's coming from NASA? What are they doing? NASA has a vision the reach for new heights to reveal the unknown for the benefit of humankind. This vision and um, the challenge of it itself was what, in the 1960s, took us to the moon. 
Well, okay, and Russia pushed a little bit with that too. <laughs> but this vision is uh, still with us and it has now come full circle. NASA has a new challenge, deep space. NASA has a new goal. And next year, we hope to test launch our first new big rocket, the SLS, the Space Launch System. This will be the biggest, most powerful rocket ever built. It, along with it will be a new capsule, a four-man capsule this time. It's called the Orion. But we're not ready to just jump into the deep end of the universe. <laughs> we have a lot to do. Back in the 60s, early 60s, you didn't just go to the moon. And that's the same today. We have a lot to, to learn, a lot to develop, and uh, a lot to test before we can ever think about that. So think what NASA is going to do is take that big rocket and in the 2020s, just three years down the road, we're going to take this SLS rocket and we're going to start a series of flights around the moon. That's good, but we're concerned with the space between the Earth and the moon. It's referred to as cislunar. And this cislunar space will be a testing and proving ground for us. You know, we've got years of development to go, so we're going to be looking at, at, at developing things that deal with radiation protection. Uh, we, knew, we knew powerful new propulsion systems. We'd like to have better communication systems. We certainly like to know more about how to store food and grow food in space. And for long-term flights, you really want to have a really good water and air recycling system. And most important, uh, we need to be ready for the human physical and mental challenges that are going to come along with years-long flights in space. Our goal, I didn't mention that a minute ago, maybe I should mention it now. Probably our goal is, would be the biggest international achievement in the history of the planet. Um, NASA's uh, pushed us toward a, a flight out there that would uh, take, take us into the deepest parts of space. Um, what we're really looking at in the 2030s, after we've done the technology work in the 2020s, right around 2030, NASA's going to have to change its view from that backyard in, of our planet and from the moon and start looking at the only planet in our solar system that's accessible to us, Mars. This is the world next door. This is a place we can go and uh, explore. We can expand over there. And we can also give this planet a better perspective. So there really is a big and, and fast-moving world of space above us right now. It's uh, with all the different new companies, new rockets, uh, new destinations. There's a lot of activity going on around, and we, we're going to be seeing more and more development of it. It's really, it's really good to, uh, to take a look at your achievements, but we all should always be pushing on toward our next future. You know, when I, things happen fast in space. When I sit down to write this little uh, TED talk, I uh, found out that there was a couple of new things that had already come about since in the last few weeks. Our astronomers have already found seven new Earths <laughs> out there that go around a single star. And the last I heard, I think they were in favor of number six. That's our, one of the most likely to be us. Also. SpaceX announced the other day that it's going to send two tourists around the moon and back next year. Now, that's about a seven, I figure that's about a, a seven-day trip, so I can only guess that the tourists only had a week's vacation time available. <laughs> but if you'd like to learn more, 
Come down and see us at the Kennedy Space Center down in Florida. It's not that far away. And by the way, don't forget to wave to the space station when it flies overhead. Because those astronauts up there, they just love the attention. <laughs> so thank you very much. Nice talking to you.